Teresa Pell, and I'm the 2021 president of the Wachiska Audubon Society. Wachiska's geographical area stretches through 17 counties in Southeast Nebraska with a responsibility for several tall grass prairies as important habitat areas for birds and other, other wildlife that, that depend on them. There are 900 and around approximately 980 national Audubon members who are part of our independent chapter, as well as our local membership numbers are about 325. And with that, I'll introduce our speaker for tonight uh, is Justin Evertson. And not unusual for a lot of us Nebraskans, Justin grew up on a farm and many readily recognize him as being part of the Nebraska statewide Arboretum. But he also has a role with Nebraska uh, Forest Service. So he earned his architecture and community and regional planning degrees from the University of Nebraska at Lincoln. So Jason, Justin's going to talk to us tonight about the role that trees have alongside Nebraska prairies. Uh, whether you think they're good or they're bad, we'll see what ju how Justin explains them to us. Take it away, Justin. And do you want questions as you go along or wait till the end? Are you muted, Justin? There we go. Am I unmuted now? Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, well, let's take questions right as we go. Okay. The, All right. Uh, and, you can also how, put them in the chat box. Arliss will be monitoring that. So feel free to put your questions in there too. So, okay, it's all yours, Justin. And how much time do you want uh, me to take? Well, we have what, quarter after seven. Um, you know, we have plenty of time and then, you know, little questions and after, I don't think you're gonna talk for two hours, are you? No, <laughs> at least 20 minutes. Okay, all right, <laughs> perfect. Okay, I'll open up the chat and try to watch that. Can, I, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Well, it's a pleasure to be here tonight. I was really uh, saddened to hear about John Farrar there. We, uh, he wrote the, the, one of the key books that got me interested in our native plants, The Field Guide to the Wildflowers of Nebraska. And I think that's been reprinted. So I'm sorry to hear that about John Farrar. That's a great book. I know it's still available. And when I'm out traipsing around uh, Nebraska, I have that handy in the growing season. So, but it's, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. I love to talk about trees and native landscapes. And I appreciated Arliss reaching out to me on this, uh, especially this month of Arbor Day, we thought we might uh, dive into trees and the value of trees and appreciating trees. And I'm a little sheepish about it when I'm around people uh, who appreciate prairie because <laughs> we have this thing called the red cedar. It's eating Nebraska and it's eating a lot of our prairie. So a lot of us aren't big fans of trees all the time. But I think maybe tonight, let's just remind ourselves that even though Nebraska is prairie country, we actually have uh, quite a few important trees in our state. And I think it's okay to think about Nebraska as a place for trees and to celebrate it in the right way. Maybe start with this, just a few words of wisdom. The three hardest things that uh, are for at least the hardest things for me to say, I was wrong. I never say that to my wife and I've regretted that many times. I need help. That's another one I have a hard time with. And then Worcestershire sauce. I'm not sure how you pronounce that one. So those three things are hard to say and let's work harder on those first two maybe. Uh, I hope that gets the point across. Let's have fun with this tonight. We're talking about trees. Let's smile and laugh. And I'll throw up some funny tree puns while I just talk about myself a little bit. You can read those and have a laugh, look at them. Yeah, I grew up out in western Nebraska, Kimball County, short grass prairie. Uh, we had very few trees on our farm, just a couple shelter belts. The toughest things like Rocky Mountain Juniper, Siberian Elm, that's about all that would want to grow out there. Uh, I came to Lincoln for school, the university. I was going to study architecture, but I got involved in working with Kim Todd on the campus landscape crew. I got fascinated around trees, all these green things growing in Lincoln, and I thought that's pretty cool. So uh, I became much enamored about trees 
And I started working for the statewide Arboretum after college in 1990. That really got me hooked on trees. And I've been dealing with trees and landscapes ever since. Let's maybe jump right into this right up front. We'll throw a couple of what I call trivia or just fun facts. I have a whole bunch of these and if you want them, I'll send them to you. You can really impress your friends and neighbors and family members at gatherings if you have a little bit of this trivia knowledge into you. Uh, here's just a couple. These are a couple national kind of champion things. California has big trees. The tallest tree in the world is right at 380 feet tall. It's a uh, uh, California's Hyperion red, uh, Coast Redwood, and that's taller than Nebraska State Capitol. The Nebraska State Capitol, the dome, I think, reaches 362 feet. And so what do we put on this? The sower, might, uh, so the, you could just imagine the sower hopping off that capital onto the tall branches of that tree. And then California's General Sherman is the uh, giant sequoia is the largest tree by volume in the world. They also get tall. And both of those species can live over 2000 years. So that's just incredible to me. Did I hear a question? No, we'll keep going. Tallest trees in Nebraska. We don't get that tall with our trees here, <laughs> but we, we still get tall trees. Really, if any tree reaches 100 feet tall in Nebraska, that's probably a champion. Uh, there are the 100 foot tall ones are few and far between, but I did measure a 115 foot tall pin oak just uh, east of Woods Park here in Lincoln this last November. And it is now our state champion pen oak. So 115 feet tall and about, they thought it would had been planted about 90 years ago. So that, that gives you an idea. We have other tall trees. There's a hundred foot tall black walnut at Arbor Lodge State Park goes back to maybe Jay Sterling Morton or at least his kids. And then 105 foot tall ponderosa pine out in the Pine Ridge of well, Western Nebraska. And there are other hundred footers, but not too many. In Nebraska, when trees get that big, <laughs> unfortunately, their lives are probably coming to an end because you get so big, you're due for lightning and wind storms and everything else. We can talk about old trees. There are 5,000 year old bristlecone pines in the southwestern part of the US. But in Nebraska, we have some old trees too. There are some uh, Rocky Mountain junipers dated to be over 800 years old out in the Wildcat Hills south of Scotts Bluff. And then we think of old trees, actually eastern Nebraska probably has oak trees that are that old or older, but their original uh, trunks were harvested at the time of settlement, so now they're re-sprouts, so it's a little hard to say how old they are. But we probably have oaks that are over a thousand years old in southeast Nebraska, although we can't age them. The national champion uh, Eastern Cottonwood grows near uh, Beatrice here in Nebraska. It's 88 feet tall, 108 feet wide with a 37 foot trunk circumference. And you all might know that Cottonwood is our state tree. And what was the state tree of Nebraska before Cottonwood? Does anybody know? It was American Elm. But that went away in the 60s and 70s when the elm tree went away with uh, Dutch elm disease. Here's a couple prairie oriented trees. Two of Nebraska's oak trees are fire adapted, believe it or not, the bur oak uh, and the dwarf chinkapin oak. I wouldn't say they require fire to live, but actually their uh, DNA lets them live in prairie and survive fire. So that's kind of cool. The are the elms, tree. Com yep, are the elms coming back? Is what that? Are the elms coming back or not? Yes, yes, and we will get to that. Was that you, okay. Anna? Yes, sorry. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that for sure. I appreciate you bringing that up. We are uh, big fans of elms for our communities, including some American elm cultivars. So uh, yeah, that's a real good question. Our native coffee tree is, an, is what I would call an evolutionary anachronism in that megafauna species that evolved to eat its fruit went extinct 20 to 30,000 years ago during the last uh, advance of the ices, ice to our part of the world. Um, and so those animals are gone, but their seeds still exist on these trees. Nothing eats them anymore, but we know that gomphotheres and mastodons and uh, 
uh, other large herbivores ate those thousands of years ago. Go to Elephant Hall and you can see the bones of those animals that used to eat Kentucky coffee tree. And it's named for the coffee-like drink that early pioneers made out of it. And yes, you can make a coffee-like drink out of it. You got to roast those seeds in the oven, um, grind them down, and then you can make, if you don't roast them, they're going to make you sick. So please roast them. There are other anachronistic fruits in our native trees, honey locust, uh, the Osage orange, believe it or not. What would have eaten the Osage orange, that big fruit? Uh, you go way back, the ginkgo was native to Nebraska 60 million years ago. <laughs> so it doesn't count as native today, but its, see, it's seed dispersers were originally dinosaurs. And then things like persimmon and pawpaw those seed dispersers were probably also gone now. They're gone and extinct. This is kind of fascinating. Butternut was discovered as a native Nebraska tree as recently just a couple years ago in 2018 along the Steamboat Trace Trail south of Nebraska City. All these years, all these botanists poking along never noticed these button butternuts growing along the Steamboat Trace Trail. Native Americans chewed on the bark and leaves of willow to treat pain, and they sometimes called it toothache tree or toothache shrub. Uh, the bark contains salicylic acid, which was important in the development of aspirin. So that's pretty cool for a native tree. All right, that was just some fun facts to throw at you to whet your appetite. Trees are cool, and it's okay to celebrate them uh, where they make sense. And so I asked this question, is it okay to love trees in a prairie state? I grew up out in Kimball. This is a couple pictures from our farm, our ranch south of town there. And when I grew up out there, <laughs> I didn't like it. I got to tell you, it was hot. It was dusty. The wind blew all the time. I would have loved to have more trees. And when you're a young person, a teenager who knows everything, you don't put much value in where your parents brought you to. And I didn't care about it. And I wanted to leave. And I came to Lincoln and went to college and I enjoy my life in Lincoln. But you know what? I've really learned to appreciate our farm now that I'm an adult. It is short grass prairie country. And I'm glad we don't have a lot of trees interrupting these wonderful short grass wildflowers out there. Uh, ground plums, sago lily, loco weed, primroses, prickly pear cactus, the pincushion cactus. Is there anything better than scarlet glow mallow or cowboy's delight for that color? Ragworts, uh, breadroot right here, or the prairie turnip. We've got silvery lupine, penstemons of all kinds, golden aster, callilophus or dwarf sun rops, larkspur kills cattle, so we gotta be careful how our cattle graze, but it's a beautiful wildflower. And that's just to say, you know, Nebraska is mostly prairie country. And we really do need to hold on to as much prairie as we can and quit having tree encroachment in our tall grass prairie. But it's okay to also appreciate our trees. So I love trees and I love prairie both. And I hope we can all find that middle ground when we think about it. Let's look quickly just at what we think about Nebraska. We are prairie country. But our biomes have changed drastically in the last 10,000 years. If we went back 12,000 years ago to the last advance of the last ice age, Nebraska was a boreal country, boreal forest, cold and icy, and much more tree cover than we have now. When the ice age or the uh, glaciers retreated, the climate warmed up rapidly and Nebraska quickly became overrun with prairies. Uh, but that's only within the last few thousand years. So yes, trees are a part of our existence. They're a part of the natural uh, beauty out here, part of our, our biomes. And remnant tree populations tell us about a past that was much more favorable to trees. Have any of you been down to Burrow Canyon in uh, Culbert, or Southwest near Culbertson? I think that's Red Willow or Hitchcock County. A remnant stand of Burr Oaks. They've been in that canyon for thousands of years and no other Burr Oaks are nearby. These are some eroded hillsides of bur oaks that are a couple hundred years old. Their roots are now exposed. So it's just kind of a fascinating place. Or how about Hackberry Hollow, uh, northeast of Sydney, uh, short grass prairie country like where I'm from. You don't see trees anywhere unless there's a drip of moisture and you happen to 
off this little escarpment and into this little valley. And here's all these wonderful old hackberries. And there's uh, fossilized seeds in there that tell us those hackberries have been there for thousands of years, maybe tens of thousands of years. Out in my home country, we're prairie, small short grass prairie, but out on the western edge of Kimball County, there's limber pine that grows right on the state border with Wyoming. And that limber pine just kind of spills out of uh, Wyoming and Colorado, the Rocky Mountains, and hangs on to western Kimball County. That's a cool tree. And now they're growing, they've been growing it in the heart of Kimball for, since Kimball was settled, we have the state champion limber pine now that's a big tree in the park. And then if you're a birder, our western pine lands are great places to see things that you don't see here, like the pinyon jay and the Clark's nutcracker. These limber pines have big edible seeds that those birds love. So Nebraska, we really do sit at an ecological crossroads right here in the middle of the country. We're, we are where east meets west. Uh, you, we're mostly prairie, but we're home to 50 native species of trees many of which reach their geographic range limit right here. And I've been told Nebraska has more trees in their range limit than any other state. We have some on the west, like ponderosa pine, limber pine, Rocky Mountain juniper, the Rocky Mountain maple, the water birch, the mountain mahogany. That's more of a shrub, but it can be a small tree. And then out here in the east, look at all these trees that reach their limit. Some of them right around Lincoln. Uh, Wilderness Park in Lincoln, if you're ever out there, that's the western extent of red oak in this country. So right here in Lancaster County, white oak, black oak, red oak, chinkapin oak, blackjack oak, hickories, buckeyes, butternuts, sycamore, white ash, downy hawthorn, and others all reach their range limit here. Let's be proud of that. We're a pretty cool place if you ask me. And then we have this thing called the Niobrara River that uh, traces along our uh, northern part of our state from west to east. And this is where east and west really do come together. It's a corridor of moving eastern species to the west, western species to the east. And then if that isn't enough, we have Ice Age, Ice Age relic species that hang on. Those aspens and those uh, Niobrara birch, those paper birch up around Smith Falls, if you're ever up in there. And those paper birch are fading fast. They're going to be gone in our lifetimes, people. So get out and enjoy them now because our, our warming climate, they've hung on since the last ice age and they're just at their wits end. So kind of sad, but just the reality of the situation, I guess. Those are our native trees, our natural trees, what brought us uh, trees to our part of the world. And then people came along. Of course, there were Native Americans here all along making use of trees. They set fires that kept trees away from the prairie. And then we European settlers came and brought trees with us. And this is where we really value trees today uh, for the things they do for us around our homes and our uh, communities and our farmsteads, all these wonderful benefits. We don't need to go through them all tonight, but this is why I prefer to live around trees. Think about one well-placed tree, this big catalpa by this little house in Cozad it's capturing 1,200 gallons of water a year that don't go off into the storm sewer. It's uh, sequestering 575 pounds of carbon. It can have 10% energy savings for that house, 75 to $100 or more. Sustains thousands of insects and dozens of birds and provides a lifetime of pleasure. So those early settlers came out here and I don't know what they were thinking, especially the uh, forefathers of my family that ended up in Kimball County. I don't know what they were thinking. I'm glad they went out there because I love Nebraska, but man alive, I can't imagine the dust, the heat, the wind, the cold. And I just wonder sometimes what was in those folks. So they got to busy planting trees. You know, They built a, sh uh, a shelter and then they started planting trees. And I've always fascinated by this picture of Lincoln from the first state capital, or maybe our second state capital, I think actually, looking southeast. The Kennard House is still here. It's a state museum now. The Nebraska Environmental Trust is right here. And so look at that, nothing but prairie and farm ground, no trees to be seen. Beautiful, I'm sure it was beautiful. Wouldn't have you have loved to see that tall grass prairie? Oh my gosh, it's all gone now. But today Lincoln is a community forest. People moved here and they planted trees. 
And I think they make Lincoln much better because of all that tree planting. So where would you rather be on a hot day in a community? Here where all the trees died and went away? Or maybe here in South Central Lincoln with all these wonderful pen oaks or, and other trees shading the street. Now all is not well with our trees. Uh, that's an understatement. And not just our native trees, natural trees, but also our community trees. We have here in our part of the world, we have all these conflicts, climate and weather, insects and diseases, invasive species, and aging and shrinking community forest canopy, lack of species diversity in our communities, lawn care issues, herbicide damage, nursery issues, urban challenges, and just human neglect and apathy. The big one, of course, though, for us here in the middle of this continent, climate and weather. Uh, it was just two months ago, maybe today, I can't remember. <laughs> we were 31 below zero, or 30 below. How cold did we get? Holy cow. And then we were almost 90 degrees last weekend. So if I did my math right, that's 120 degrees difference in less than two months. So our trees really have to survive some things, drought, floods, wind, hail, tornadoes, ice storms, temperature swings, etc. There's a reason my home country of Kimball County don't, doesn't have many trees. We're lucky to get 15 inches of rain a year. That's a good year for us. And I joke about it, but it's halfway true. Most of that rain comes in two bad hail events. <laughs> and so it's tough to be a tree in Nebraska. It really is to think about all that. And then throw in these insects and diseases. Uh, and this is all exacerbated by we humans bringing these insects and diseases to our trees. Now we have emerald ash borer, a non-native insect. It's going to kill 44 million Nebraska trees in the coming decades. And that's a big uh, void we're going to have to fill. The walnut twig beetle is causing thousand cankers disease on walnut. Japanese beetle is disfiguring our trees here in the east. Bagworms is a native war, uh, insect. And that actually is a pretty important food source to some of our birds like chickadees and the titmouse. So if we're spraying bagworms, we're spraying food for some of our birds, but bagworms get on spruce trees and people don't like that, so they spray them off. And then a couple of diseases, pine wilt disease. This killed millions of scotch pine across Nebraska. Scotch pine were introduced here. The disease is native. So it just was a matter of time before we lost those trees, unfortunately. And then here's a bad one coming our way, bur oak blight. We're not exactly sure it's a fungal disease. We don't know sure what triggers it, but if we start losing our bur oaks, I'm leaving. And then you think about our community trees, the urban challenges, people, you know, cars, we're constantly building and digging things digging into tree roots. Look at this picture here. This is from Kansas. You're really going to plant a tree here? <laughs> I don't know what. Yeah, I guess we're going to plant trees there. So those are challenges that trees in the forest don't have to face. And then for our community trees, herbicide issues and lawn care issues are a really growing concern. And I can't reiterate this enough that we are really perplexed about what's happening to our trees across Eastern Nebraska from herbicide damage, both lawn and agriculture related. It's a head scratcher for us and we're really concerned about the health of our trees. Uh, in fact, in Waverly where I live, every year I just cringe at the thought of my oaks and the red buds I've planted. They look horrible now every year. And that's from farm chemicals drifting in. I am not complaining about farm farming and farm practices. We need farming in this part of the world for sure, but I sure hope we can find a way to do farming and not kill uh, our native ecosystems and our trees. <clears throat> We're slowly losing our big trees in our communities. If we look at inventories, 30 to 50% of what was here in the 1960s is gone. Those shade trees are gone. Some of them have been replanted, but we've lost 30 to 50% of that canopy. And of course, part of that, some of you are old enough to remember, I was just a kid, but Dutch elm disease came through and changed our communities drastically within just a few years. Did we learn our lesson? Some ways we did, but in many communities, we, 
replanted with monocultures of ash. So here's East Lincoln. This is in the Meadow Lane area, and that neighborhood is loaded with green ash. And in this aerial picture, I would guess 80% of these trees will be gone now in 20 years. We didn't do a good job of species diversity. How about just apathy? I think our parents and our grandparents knew the trees around them because they had to use them for lumber and wood burning and food and shelter. And now we don't. We live inside in air conditioned comfort. We've all got our phones and our gadgets. We watch TV and we're just apathetic to the trees around us and the landscape around us. I like to walk uh, the Havelock area of Lincoln when I'm trying to just get some exercise. And this is a big wide spreading American elm that used to be there just a few years ago. It probably lived 80 or 100 years right in this spot. I can't remember the intersection, but it was way bigger than that house. <laughs> Shaded that whole intersection. It survived the 1930s and Dutch elm disease, but it did not survive new owners just a couple of years ago. It's their property right to remove that tree for sure. I wouldn't stand in the way of that. But a little bit of that happens every year on about every block. And so we're just slowly losing those trees. We can do better, we believe, at the statewide arboretum. We can do better in the Forest Service. These are the things we think we can just start doing better and we can control poor species selection, poor siting and design, we can do better with our nursery stock and our planting practices. We can do better with our pruning and care. We can relax on our lawn care. We can do better by soil and we can get people to appreciate trees more. And maybe if we did all that, we'd reduce about 80% of the harm to our trees in our communities. It starts with good nursery stock. And we've got a little bit of a conundrum here because our nursery providers are really doing a lot better job of providing high quality nursery trees. The problem is in our part of the world, we don't have any large scale nursery growers. We have a few wonderful, great mom and pop small scale growers that we value the heck out of. But most trees come to Nebraska from growers that are all over the country and they're not worried about the Nebraska market. So it's a little bit of a catch 22 how do we get the best trees in Nebraska when we don't have the best market for tree growing? We'll talk about that a little later, but so there's some good trends coming along and we are getting much better root systems than we did 20 or 30 years ago. We have a really great uh, local nursery here. I don't know if you, any of you know Heather and Brian Byers. They have Great Plains Nursery up northwest of Lincoln, north of Valparaiso and they've gone to this grow bag system and they're mostly growing native trees or trees that are collected from seeds here in Nebraska. And this is just an example of a bur oak growing in their growing system. And look at here, four years after planting in Omaha, look at that wonderful tree. We gotta do proper planting. We, we kill a lot of trees right when we plant them because we plant them too deep and we don't deal with our circling and girdling roots that come back around and, and girdle the stem quite often. So we got to get that right. We're doing better. And then we've got to do design better. We scatter trees in our landscapes like pencils, you know, in this lawn, carpet of lawn, and then we wonder why they struggle. Let's group our trees together wherever we can and plant them with associated understory plants, separate them from the lawn. Let's think about our healthy soil the best trees grow in healthy, dynamic soils that are part of the wood wide web. Have you heard that term? The wood wide web. Our trees in our forests are connected by uh, a fungal hyphae, a fungal highway, a pathway of mycorrhiza, the symbiotic association between soil fungi and plant roots. And their hypha go all out through the soil and they're able to communicate with each other uh, chemically via these hyphae. And they think that a tree over here can talk to a tree over there by that communication, that uh, wood wide web through those fungal pathways. And those fungal pathways bring nutrients to the trees. If we mimic that in our uh, communities, our trees will be healthier. So add some mulch around the trees. Don't haul the mulch and the wood debris and the leaves away every year. Bring it back, put it around the trees, separate it from the lawn. The trees will really appreciate it. Let's get away from this. 
with the trees in our landscapes, not just little lone soldiers, uh, islands of something out there in the middle of a sea of lawn. We're not doing our trees favors by doing this. <clears throat> Ultimately, it comes down to selecting the right tree for the right place. And here's where we have a little bit of a conundrum. How do we create biodiverse and resilient community forests that balance tree adaptab adaptability with ecological goals? The problem is in a community, in an urban area, we don't have native soils. So some of our best native trees don't do well in all these urban conflicts. What does really well <laughs> in the worst of urban sites? Siberian elm, mulberry, tree of heaven, honey locust maybe, red cedar, not always the, the trees that we wanna have all over. But if we work harder at it, we think we can bring more native trees into our urban environment. But we also have to realize we can't make it perfect. It can't be all native trees. We won't get the community forest we, we like. So we just got to think about this. And that brings me to this whole uh, topic where uh, I think Arliss might have brought this up too, that uh, Doug Tallamy gets a lot of coverage now for his work. He's an entomologist at the University of Delaware. One of the seminal books that I read maybe 15 years ago now that really changed my mind was Bringing Nature Home. Read that book. He lays out all the research about how our native trees sustain native insects and native birds. And then he took that knowledge and he wrote this book, Nature's Best Hope. And he has wonderful ideas in there about how to do it right in your yard. Everybody in your own yard, can you can make a difference. And then I'm reading this book right now, The Nature of Oaks. Uh, that it's all about the value of oaks, especially for insects and biodiversity. And Doug started this mission called Homegrown National Park. The goal, well, the Homegrown National Park is a grassroots call to action to restore biodiversity and ecosystem function by planting native plants and creating new ecological networks right in our own backyards or front yards or wherever you want to do it. The goal is 20 million acres of native plantings in the U.S. That is approximately half the green lawns of privately owned properties. That would, 20 million acres would dwarf most of the national parks in total size in our country. That's the goal. I think it's wonderful. If you've planted native plants, get on the website here, go to Homegrown National Park and register. Uh, your native plantings, you'll be a part of the solution. This is what really turned me on to native trees. Doug's work from Bringing Nature Home, where he highlighted Lepidoptera species supported by native trees. This is the top 10 native trees. Oak is at the top. These are North American native oak trees sustaining 517 species of Lepidoptera, literally thousands and thousands of individual a lepidoptera on any tree. So willow, cherry, cottonwood, crab apples, some maples, elm, hickory and pecan, hawthorn, and even our ash. We are gonna lose trees that sustain 150 species of lepidoptera when our ash go away. Now look at two trees that get planted like crazy across the country, ornamental pear and ginkgo. They sustain zero, zero. And so when we think about trees that aren't getting their leaves eaten, that's not a good thing. <laughs> it's not bad to have a ginkgo in the neighborhood. It is bad to have an ornamental pear, and we'll talk about that. This was news to me, though. Just I read this the other day, reading uh, Doug's book, The Nature of Oaks. I did not realize this. You guys probably are smarter than me. But many overwintering birds, even here in eastern Nebraska, but especially in Doug's area of the northeast U.S., they still re uh, require caterpillars to get through the winter. And a lot of oak trees, big old oak trees in a community, those uh, caterpillars are wedging themselves into the bark and trying to survive through the winter in suspended animation. Those birds still find them. So they're still eating caterpillars even in the winter. I thought, man, I didn't know that. So I learned something new. Native trees provide bird habitat. And one of my favorite things to do now every day in my life is just look out my backyard. I have a suet feeder on my white ash tree and I hate the thought of losing that tree, but I see so many wonderful birds at my bird feeders. 
you talk about free entertainment. Right now I'm getting way too many starlings. I'm trying to trap a few of these starlings and get rid of them, but I see birds that I just never used to see and they fascinate me and I love it. The other two weeks ago, we had cedar wax wings here by the hundreds. I don't know what was going on because I don't have any fruit in my yard. They must have found it in the park or something. So think native trees for sure. But what is native? Remember what I talked about early on, trees came in and out of Nebraska over the eons. So we don't have to look within our just set geographic uh, political boundaries. The birds and the plants don't care. Let's think regionally. If we think regionally, we can look at white spruce from the Black Hills, limber pine from Kimball County, soapberry from South Central Kansas, pecan from Northwest Missouri, swamp white oak from Southwest Iowa, and even sugar maple from uh, Eastern South Dakota. We can use all those trees and call them native to expand the value and diversity of our own landscapes and forests. We at the Statewide Arboretum, along with the Nebraska Forest Service and our green industry partners are collecting seeds from these trees all over the region. We're working with green industry partner to grow these trees to try and expand the availability of our native trees. It's a slow, hard process. We're, we're uh, swimming upstream against the nursery industry, but we're making progress. So we're looking at trees in Southeast Nebraska, like at Indian Cave State Park, or have any of you been down to Rulo Bluffs and explored the wonderful trees there on that Nature Conservancy land? We go out to these remnant populations like those Kimball County Limber Pines or those Burr Oak Canyon trees. Great Plains Nursery sells now something called the Relic Burr Oak. Uh, comes right out of Burr Oak Canyon. Look at that wonderful tree. And it's gonna be well adapted to a climate changing for us. We're looking in Kansas and Oklahoma because their climate is gonna be our climate. We are looking in Southern uh, and Southeast Colorado. These are gonna be great trees for Western Nebraska, the Panhandle and McCook area. And then we're looking for urban survivors in all our cities. We have neat old trees that are telling us they're ready to be here long-term and to survive. Their genetics have shown that they'll survive urban conditions. Tulip trees, black gum, all kinds of oaks and things like that. Uh, magnolias are a treasure trove of, of things in our communities. So just a few targeted species as I wrap up. I mentioned to you oaks. I'm reading a book about oaks right now from Doug Tallamy. And he will tell you if you can only plant one tree and you're trying to sustain biodiversity and you like birds, plant an oak tree. Don't just plant one tree. <laughs> plant an oak tree and some other trees and understory trees as well. But look at all these great native oaks. These are our native Nebraska oaks, black oak, white oak, red oak, blackjack oak, burr oak, chinkapan oak, and dwarf chinkapan oak. Here's a big burr oak. This is in Milford, right off the Southeast Community College campus site. Look at that wonderful tree. What came first, that house or the tree? I think the tree was there first. Chinkapan oak is a wholly underutilized tree from the Great Plains. Let's plant this, the heck out of it. Here it was planted in downtown Omaha around the state office building a few years ago, and it's doing great as a native tree in an urban situation. All these other oaks, here's Gamble Oak out in the west, Buckley Oak, which is a great tree for South uh, and Western Nebraska, Swamp White Oak, Shingle Oak, Post Oak, Schumert oak, cherry bark oak, overcup oak, chestnut oak, you get the idea. Now it can't just be all oaks. We're gonna lose a lot of ash trees coming up and you know what a great one-to-one -one replacement would be for an ash is a pecan, Caria illinoisensis. It does great in Eastern Nebraska. It grows about the same size and speed as a green ash and it actually does much more for biodiversity than our own native green ash. If you want an ornamental tree, don't plant that ornamental calorie pear. Plant our native black cherry. You'll be glad you did. It's a beautiful tree and it sustains birds and insects and caterpillars like you wouldn't believe. And then we had this question earlier. Yes, we can plant elm. The American elm is coming back. There are disease resistant cultivars 
And then there are several uh, other kinds of elms that we can grow. Like this is rock elm native to Eastern Nebraska. It does uh, have a tendency to Dutch elm disease in our Eastern part of the state, but out West, this is Cheyenne, Wyoming. This is rock elm. It's a wonderful tree. We should plant the heck out of it in Western Nebraska. And then there are some hybrids that are really resistant to disease like Triumph Elm here, New Horizon Elm, and then this David Elm, which comes to us from Asia, but is uh, not a seed threat or a, an invasive threat. And it's tough as tough as nails. So there's elms that we can grow. Sometimes it's easier to say what not to plant. And let's just quit planting this junk the stuff that's invasive and overplanted. And I would start with these Freeman maples on the left. They're a hybrid between silver maple and red maple. They're good trees, but they're overplanted. They come apart in storms. And then this thing here, the ornamental pear is planted all over the country. It is invasive, even in Lincoln now. Wilderness Park, it is popping up everywhere. We need to quit planting the ornamental pears. Tell your friends and neighbors no more. And then here are a couple others on that list. Russian olive, golden rain tree, amber maple, tree of heaven, mulberry, and cork tree. As I wrap up, I'll just tell you if you're ever interested, come out to Waverly and I'll show you around Wayne Park. The trees I've been growing or planting in our community arboretum for several years now. We plant them in groups and we plant understory things beneath them so we're not competing with the lawn. Arbor Day is April 30th, our chance to plant a tree uh, on a holiday, I guess. I guess we could plant trees any day of the year, but plant trees where it makes sense. I'm not a fan of just saying, go plant a tree. Plant a tree where it makes sense. It needs to be the right tree in the right spot. The first Arbor Day was in 1872. They planted 1 million trees. I don't think we plant nearly that many anymore. <laughs> And we grow way more trees than we used to then. So let's get out and plant trees where they make sense. And I'll just alert you to this if you're interested. Uh, we, we can keep you posted. There's an event being planned for Ash Hollow State Park. Uh, probably will be late September or October. And we're going to have fun exploring Ash Hollow where native green ash intermingle with other tree species, including a hybrid juniper, a hybrid between Rocky Mountain juniper and red cedar. And then all this wonderful prairie out there. There are cool prairie plants and even wetland plants to see right nearby. So I'll keep you posted on that. Uh, the statewide Arboretum Spring Affair, uh, you can order plants and that helps sustain our organization. You can order plants through April 18th or until they're sold out. Uh, and those are all mostly native plants, the kinds of things that we're talking about here tonight to sustain biodiversity. And with that, I am done. I'll, sh I'll leave this slide up just for a second and I am ready to take questions. Okay, Arliss, are there any in the chat box? You're on mute. I want to... Joe Francis would like to know about um... Uh, emerald ash borer and three things you can do or that Justin would um, suggest that you do for that situation. Yeah, the two ash trees in her front yard. Um, I should have had this dollar figure on my head. It's like $10 per uh, foot diameter or foot circumference roughly to treat. So most of our bigger ash trees are going to be like $200 to $300 to have treated by a private uh, person doing that. And so there's a trade-off there. Uh, I'm not a big fan of putting chemicals in trees that are going to kill all the insects in the trees, because remember our woodpeckers are eating those insects. But what if we lose a great big green ash? <laughs> that tree is also sustaining a lot of wildlife, so it's kind of a conundrum. I would suggest you save some of our green ash, the bigger, better ones that are really in good shape, save a few of those. And we'll probably have to let 90% of them go away. That's just my personal philosophy. What we think will happen with uh, EAB is it has a crescendo. It hits real hard in an area, kills a lot of ash trees, but then uh, natural predators or just the slowdown of all of that reduces the population 
and then background trees are able to survive longer, almost exactly like Dutch elm disease went with American elm. So there will be green ash survivors. And if we help to provide some survivor trees to get through that bottleneck of death, we'll have a seed source to help continue our native trees. I hope that makes sense. That's a personal decision to you. I'm wrestling with uh, uh, treating my white ash in my backyard because that's where my suet feeder is. <laughs> that's my best shade tree. So that's a tough question. What would, what would you suggest replacing the ash trees with? Uh, obviously you're a fan of oaks, but if you could yeah. have, what would be your top three choices? Okay, yep, I'd pick an oak as number one. I'd pick a pecan as number two. Uh, reason I say pecan, uh, people squirm a little bit about pecan because it can drop big seeds. But you know what, if you're not, if you're planting a seed grown pecan, almost always they get cleaned up by the jays and the squirrels. They're not like a walnut drop in that big mess. So it won't be a messy tree. And then beyond that, um, I'm kind of a, <laughs> yeah, this will turn people off, but I was going to say sycamore. Uh, but people don't like the mess of the sycamore. So maybe I'd go with a sugar maple. A sugar maple is woefully underplanted in eastern Nebraska. It's a better maple than the red maple for us, in my opinion. This is America, though. You can plant whatever you want, and you can be happy about that. You just don't <laughs> plant those ornamental pears. Justin, do you have any uh, thoughts on hackberries? I love hackberry. I'm glad you brought that up, Arliss. And Joe, I, I probably should have said uh, hackberry would be my fourth choice there. You know, one issue with hackberry, we have way too many of them in some of our Western communities, like in the right behind me in my background image, those are hackberries in uh, the heart of Kimball. But we don't have any young hackberry trees coming up behind them because they haven't been sold in the nursery industry for 50 years. So we need to start replanting hackberry. You talk about a great tree for birds and wildlife, uh, tough as nails, uh, hackberry for sure. Do we have any persimmon trees in Nebraska? Yes, we do. They're nearly native into northwest uh, uh, Missouri, but they're not native in Nebraska. But if you go down to the Brownville area and poke around Brownville, you'll see there's a couple plantations there with persimmon and some wildings that have popped up in the town. I've planted them in Waverly. They do just fine. The one thing about a persimmon to be aware of is they are male and female, so you need two trees to get fruit. And then the um, if you do any, they have a tendency tendency to sucker sprout and root sprout all over and a lot of people don't like that. But they're a great tree we should plant more of. Justin, would you Dean. like to share? Yeah, how you doing? <laughs> uh, Justin, would you like to share with us some uh, communities that have best practices for urban forests and even some of your favorite uh, uh, certified arboretums in the state? Oh man, that's a good question. <laughs> Uh, well, yeah, I'm actually kind of proud of what you're doing there in Blue Springs, Dean, uh, with the Trailside Arboretum. That's pretty special, and you may be able to talk about it here. The, they really have done some cool things in Blue Springs, creating an arboretum along the uh, Standing Bear Trail there. And now we can go see the pileated woodpeckers. I want to come down, man. I really love that idea. If you had one arboretum to go visit, there's a hundred and some across the state. But I'd probably send you up to Pierce and Gilman Park, uh, north of Norfolk there. Gary Zimmer planted an arboretum that'll, it has over 300 varieties of trees and shrubs. It'll knock your socks off. I love my arboretum in Waverly. I'm pretty proud of it. The campus at the university is really cool. So get online and, and look at our network of arboretum across the state. And then some communities. Um, you know, one that surprise, might surprise you if you have some time, go traipse around Wahoo of all places. That town, little town has a lot of diversity of trees in it, but I like to walk our small towns and every town it's, is in itself an arboretum. You'd be surprised what lurks in backyards and front yards and pretty cool. So that was a great question, Dean. 
it does amaze me some of the towns though that are uh, uh, you know a hundred years old back even in that time where they planted you know had really had a planting a tree planting program and had a great appreciation until of course they planted too much of the elm but i mean yeah all of our basket communities there is some sort of leadership there that really developed that in our communities you know yep they took it much more seriously back then i would say lincoln is we have a really wonderful resource in lincoln uh, the old neighborhoods here are much better off than a lot of cities its size. So we can be proud of that too. And then isn't Potter a little a town, what population? Oh, yeah. 100? yeah, it's got a neat program. Yeah, that little town of Potter, if you're heading out toward Kimball, a stop in Potter, there's a landscape architect that lived there and he's a banker, but he loved trees. And that town is loaded with trees that shouldn't be growing there. <laughs> trees don't read the books. They'll grow wherever they want to. Justin, uh, could you, I've got a friend uh, that has a farm around uh, Spalding, and uh, he pointed out the benefit of the uh, big uh, cottonwood trees and uh, making homes for bats to be able to take care of the uh, mosquito population. Um, is there other trees that will um, do that type of uh, housing for beneficial um, birds and rodents and whatever else is flying? Or yeah, Troy, that's a great question. I love it. Uh, I was just walking I can't remember which neighborhood the other day in Lincoln, looking at the big trees, and I was seeing these wonderful woodpecker holes, 30 to 40 feet up in the trees, and it, you just hit the nail on the head that we got to be a little uh, um, malleable in our thinking so that we allow some of these, I hate to say completely dead trees, but there are big pin oaks in Lincoln that have wonderful cavities for birds, and I think we can do both. So you're absolutely right, Troy. Uh, the one thing we would say is make sure it's not a hazard tree that could fall and kill somebody, but otherwise we need places like that for bird habitat for sure. And bats, right on bats. I, I'm not sure where bats live, but they sure come out every night at dusk and make our summer so much better. Justin, how, um, how long do Japanese maple trees last? Um, I think if you got 20 years out of one, of course, they don't read the books either. And if you're patient with them, you know, one thing to think about with every tree, even a little ornamental tree, it has to grow a new skin every year to survive. So it has to get bigger, wider and taller or it'll stop growing. Um, and so in that sense, it's probably going to outgrow its space at some point. And that's usually when those trees disappear. But I'd say 20 to 30 years. How about the uh, Blair maple? They're supposed to have originated in Lincoln or in Nebraska? Yeah, right. We have some cool native cultivars. The Blair silver maple has these cut leaf. It was a really attractive silver maple. I don't know if it's still available, but then there's the nursery there um, near Blair that was also the founding of, of uh, Marshall seedless ash. And then Redmond Linden came out of one of those nurseries too. So some pretty important trees nationally came out of Nebraska nurseries. Uh, this is Joellen and um, my book group read the books by the Vermont uh, specialist you talked about. And he stressed that if you, if you grow trees that are not native, then the birds, um, cannot raise their young and the insects and everything that you it's doing no good whatsoever to any of the other nature uh, because they will not eat them uh, and they can't feed their own young if they don't have these sources. Exactly right. Yeah, we used to used to read the nursery literature and it would say a tree, the, an attribute would be clean foliage, nothing eats it. and. <laughs> Now we go, no, that's not the right thing to be doing. 
And it is amazing if you look at an ornamental pear or a ginkgo, it's like they're plastic leaves or something because nothing eats them. And it wouldn't be, you know, you wonder what it's going to be like years from now if people don't want to have these big trees. What would Lincoln look like if we didn't have big trees anymore? And, that's and, where some, we're of, yeah. and some of those pe some of those others don't last very long, so you wonder mm -hmm. what it would be like. Yep. You didn't say much about pin oaks. What do you think about pin oaks? Yeah, I, uh, I'm sure glad Lincoln has all those pin oaks. And you know, that's another one that doesn't get planted anymore because it tends to be chlorotic. In older neighborhoods in Lincoln, we used to save our topsoil so the trees could survive and do well. But now in our new neighborhoods, we, uh, we mostly end up with subsoil that's high pH and the pin oaks don't do well on that. So it's hard to recommend it anymore, but it was a great tree. I know a lot of people curse it because it drops so many acorns. But, oh uh, yeah. <laughs> I, they're a good tree for our neighborhoods. Unfortunately, yeah, we probably won't be replanting them. We'll have to shift to red oak or white oak or other trees. And when you were talking about the pine wilt, I think of Pioneer Park when all those trees died and we were just sick, but we also got to see what it was like probably when they started planting that park and how, I don't know how many years ago that's been now, but it just seemed like they started growing quickly and filled the, those areas all in again, but yeah, it doesn't look too bad now, does it? No. Yeah. <laughs> One thing you said that uh, sycamore, you're not into sycamore, but look how neat they look in the wintertime. And I think they're, uh, I know they drop a lot of leaves. I had one, but they're, they're pretty, they're a pretty sight to see. And, uh, you know, and I couldn't understand why that was a thing about you. And also the burr oak at uh, Peter Pan Park, there's a huge one there. I mean, I never knew what a burr oak was until I saw the, the acorns that came out of that. And that was a new experience for me. Yeah, right on, Bertha. I like the sycamore too. I, I can't get anybody to plant it because of its messy nature, but, and that's a great, that's one of those that usually has quite a bit of open cavities for birds and stuff in it too. So I'm with you a hundred percent. So that looks like there's one, I don't know if we've asked this one about uh, golden currant, bare root shrubs on, or someone has, has those uh, golden currant, bare roots shrubs on order. I believe they are Eastern white pine in the area. How far is safe from the neighbor? Yeah. Oh, that's a real good question. And I do not know enough about that alternate host issue with the white pine rust, currant and white pine. Uh, did somebody else on tonight know enough about it? It's interesting to me because white pines and currants are native together in Northeast Iowa. So um, it doesn't scare me a whole lot, but I don't want to speak out of my knowledge zone on that. Now, that was my question, Justin. I don't know, you know, if I should plant them and jeopardize, you know, the, the neighborhood basically. Uh, I don't think so. I have not heard of that being a big issue in Lincoln, and we've sold a lot of currants in recent years, but that's a really uh, spot-on question to ask. I'll try Thank to dig you. into that. If I learn anything, I'll let you know, but a real good question. Yeah, I actually bought them from the Kansas, um, you know, a pollinator bundle from the Kansas Forest Service, uh, and I didn't do my research thoroughly enough. So now I'm unsure what to do. I have heard about that. I do pay close attention to the Nebraska, my cohorts are the Nebraska Forest Service, forest health people. And that has never risen to be a big issue in our office yet. So I don't think it's a big issue yet, but it could be coming our way. A few years ago, they got after us for selling the uh, Mahonia Ripons the uh, Oregon grape from Western Nebraska, because it was the alternate host for wheat rust and <laughs> as a native plant, and yet they didn't want us planting it in our <laughs> landscape. So it's kind of frustrating to think that sometimes. 
Uh, Do you know? I, I was wondering, what is the purpose, uh, what's the goal here of the uh, crossing between the Rocky Mountain Juniper and the Eastern Red Cedar? Yeah, that happens. They, this is what the botanists tell us, that uh, uh, Ash Hollow is an area where the Eastern Red Cedar and the Rocky Mountain Juniper co-mingle. And now there are uh, hybrid varieties in there, and that's about the only spot in the U.S. where you find those. That's just kind of a unique thing there. Everybody's down on red cedar, so <laughs> I don't know if that's anything to celebrate, but kind of an interesting tidbit. So that's a, it's a it's a it's a natural cross. They're not doing it. Uh, nope. They're not doing it intentionally. Nope, not doing it on purpose. The oh, part okay. of the problem with the red cedar, uh, we've learned now, is that we, you know, they got planted in shelter belts all over. Right. Usually, it was the fastest, most prolific ones that got seed produced for the next generation. Those collected and got. So we've just created these super trees, put them in our shelter belts, and. Uh, that just exacerbated the problem, but we don't have that issue with these hybrids. Okay. I see a question here about bristlecone pine. Uh, there are bristlecone pines in arboretums and a good place, the best place to go see them is like out in Scotts Bluff, Kimball, uh, Shadron State College, out there where the air is drier and the moisture is less. Uh, the Kimball Arboretum, we planted several bristlecone pines and they haven't been watered in 30 years. They look wonderful. You put them in a lawn and they struggle. You know how many... What's the best way to contact you, Justin? I appreciate you saying that, Troy. Yeah, anybody can contact me. Uh, my email is jevertson1 at unl.edu. I'd be happy to send Thank you anything you. I could. I can send you plant lists and uh, some of this other stuff we talked about tonight. I'd print off the PowerPoint for you if you wanted it. So. Justin, somebody says here that turkey vultures like sycamores. Oh, cool. They like <laughs> to roost high, don't they? Yeah. I've been watching them in Waverly the last few nights. Uh, we must have a resident population here now all of a sudden. So they're back. Do you know of any magnolias that are better for our area? I just, they're so pretty and yet it just seems like it's always freezing or blowing the, like crazy. And yeah. you wonder if some are more hardy? Great question, Lana. The, have you noticed the magnolias blooming the last week? Those well, were, and the freeze that, you know. Yeah, they one really night. look good the last few days and that usually tells us we're due for a freeze. Those are <laughs> mostly saucer magnolia in Lincoln. But there are wonderful other magnolias, and one we don't plant enough of is native to Iowa and Missouri, and that's the cucumber magnolia. It's not mm. quite as striking in flower, but it is a wonderful tree. And if you come out to Wayne Park in Waverly, where I'm at, I have a little magnolia collection going, and you'd be surprised. We can grow big leaf magnolia, magnolia tripetala, cucumber magnolia, um, and they're all North American native. So what is a, the easy directions to get to that park, Justin? Yeah, Wayne Park, if you come to Waverly, we've got a, a Casey's Convenience Store. You turn just right by it and go south, and that street takes you right into the park. Okay, okay, all right, thank you. The trees are mostly labeled along the trail. Okay. I have just a very basic tree planting question. So some of the, the photos that you showed, the, the mulch, people were mulching up kind of a cone around the tree. And then, you know, you mentioned having, so the, the crown of the, the tree is above ground when you plant it. And what I've been taught is that the mulching, you kind of create a moat around the tree base and then not the mulch up against the tree itself. And then when it rains, it helps the moisture go down into the root area. It, yep, right on, exactly. I okay. should have explained that in that picture better. That's what they call volcano mulch. And we only want a two to three inch layer of mulch around the tree. And just like you did, you created that little ring around. That's a good right. idea. Okay. No mulch right on the trunk. I see a question here about evergreens. 
I didn't talk about pines or firs and only just because I didn't have enough time. Uh, Eastern Nebraska is kind of shifting away from being good evergreen country, not quickly, but we're not the best part of the state for spruce, but we can do con color fir real well, several kinds of uh, pine trees. Uh, so we can do evergreens just fine here. But we do think with our changing climate, that is one thing that'll be harder for us in Southern and Southeast Nebraska. What about myrtle trees? Uh, like crepe myrtle? Yeah. Yeah, there are hardy, hardy crepe myrtle shrubs that uh, were selected and grown in Kansas that I think we'll be able to grow. I haven't paid, do any of you remember the Fleming brothers? Didn't they uh, do some crepe myrtle hardiness? Anyhow, I can't remember. I don't think we'll do crepe myrtle trees anytime soon, but it wouldn't surprise me the way <laughs> Uh, the way climate is shifting. I love to go watch those. I go visit my daughter in Richmond, Virginia, and they have crepe myrtles all over. But they're an introduced tree there, and they're um, trying to uh, limit the, the planting of them. Justin? Yeah, Dean? Would you, would you want to talk on the importance, too, of pruning uh, trees, too? I mean, you know, there's the planting of trees, but also the timeliness and pruning to help them for longevity. Yeah, really good point, Dean. <clears throat> I don't know how long I have to talk about pruning, but you better, the one thing to say is when you plant that tree, have your pruning, or pruning plan in mind for the next 10 years. <clears throat> so if it's near a sidewalk or a street, you're gonna have to get the canopy up eventually, but you can't do it right all at once. <clears throat> and we've learned to leave the low branches on these young trees as long as you can but you gotta take them off by the time they're one or two inch caliper. So just plan ahead for that. <clears throat> and then remember, uh, there's no law that says a tree has to be pruned up. If you've got room to let it sweep the ground, go for it. Just be aware of that when you plant it, that that's your plan. Uh, otherwise, if it gets away from you, you'll be taking off big branches that you didn't want to do. So I, I appreciate that question, Dean. Just get a good plan in place. Most of our shade trees, the big thing to think about is you try to eliminate co-dominant leaders. <clears throat> so if two leaders are growing side by side up the tree, you try to take one of those out early in its life uh, for most species, not every species, but most that are shade trees that get tall. And not always the same time of year, right? Yeah, pruning right now is actually a really good time to prune because the trees are waking up and they're going to put their uh, a lot of their energy stores into walling off those wounds. They don't heal those wounds. They have to wall them off. And if you and they do most of that in the spring. So um, now is a good time of year. Late winter and early spring is a good time for pruning. It's not bad to prune any time all year if you're careful about it. The one exception might be red oak for us because you can transfer oak wilt disease in red oaks. If your uh, saw is dirty and you cut into one with disease. So they say, don't do that in the growing season, only prune red oaks in the dormant season, but we don't have oak wilt as a big problem here yet, so. <clears throat> is your expertise including shrubs? I know a little bit about shrubs. I like to plant shrubbery with my trees. So if you don't have room for trees, uh, what shrubs would be good for Lincoln? And think again about native or regionally native shrubs. Native. And we have quite a few of them. There are really wonderful things that are like large shrubs or small trees. And the first one off my mind almost always is black haw viburnum. That is a great uh, tree or large shrub or small tree if you're into that kind of thing. And then there are about eight other viburnums that are North American natives that we can grow, tolerate shade or sun. I really love sumacs. There's a sumac we don't plant enough of. That's the shining sumac. It thick, it forms a little bit, but it's not super aggressive like the smooth sumac. It's a great wildlife habitat plant. Birds love it. It's a great winter cover for birds. It has seeds for birds in the winter. 
and it is the most attractive, bright, brilliant red in the fall that you can imagine. So uh, people don't want me to say it, but our own native gray dogwood, <laughs> it's aggressive. I like our American plum, American hazelnut, and we have one of the most wonderful service berries in the Midwest native here, the downy service berry. So that's just a few off the top of my head. The one thing we don't have a lot of is small shrubs that people want in their smaller landscapes. Uh, that's a little bit harder. And that's where I would just shift to some of our better prairie plants or shade tolerant understory plants. Our small, uh, our, uh, oh, gee, the, um, oh, the, the three you just talked about. Um, oh. uh, hazelnut and yeah. service berry. No, the, uh, oh, uh, the one that you said about the berries on top that they like. Um, oh, yeah, the uh, Shining Sumac. Yeah, Sumac. Do uh, I noticed back home that the Sumac, some of them uh, had uh, fruit on and some didn't. Are there a male and female Sumac? That's a good question. I don't think so. But does anybody else know that? I don't think but some of them didn't have the fruit on and others did. And I thought, well, there must be a male and a female sumac. You might now, I'm not right. sure what kind of sumac I'm talking about, say. Yeah, and you're probably in our ditches around here, that's usually the smooth sumac. And that's the one most prominent tolerating road ditches and railroad corridors. And I, I see that too, where sometimes they don't have much of a seed stock on them. I don't know what's going on there. Look. What kind do they have at Holmes Lake on the right. south side of the lake there? I don't know. I don't get to the south side of Holmes Lake. Is it a wetland plant? It's sumac and it's just huge. Oh. It just grows huge. Okay, yeah, that that could be staghorn sumac. Because I'm surprised they let it keep growing there, but they do. It's a, it's a Midwest native too. The staghorn is really, a it suckers pretty hard, so people don't like it that way. <laughs> but it's a great native plant if you got room for it. And it can be a small tree. <laughs> okay, yeah. how about just a one or two more questions? We've kind of exhausted Justin with the questions. Great job. <laughs> I love it. Good work, everybody. Yeah, great job. Uh, anything else in the chat box, Arliss? Well, um, there's a comment here that says, how close are we getting to hardiness zone six in Lincoln? Or is climate change making it difficult to establish hardiness zones according to current guidelines? Yeah, we're uh, unfortunately we're here in the middle of the continent where we still get these wild temperature swings. And even though we're generally warming, uh, we were just reminded two months ago that Mother Nature is still in charge and we got down to 30 below. And that's real. So we were we went from 4B to 5 to 5B in the last 100 years. But uh, so it's really hard to say. It's those spring and fall temperature snaps that are always going to be the driver, even though our average temperature is going to be warmer. So it's just a little hard to say. Our Midwest native trees and shrubs are probably genetically tolerant of that. But then when we bring in non-native things, they get caught with their pants down and uh, struggle. So that's a tough question to, who knows what the future is going to say there. We, we started to think we're going to be able to expand the palette of plants for us, but now we're wondering again all of a sudden with that bitter cold. One last question. Uh, what are your thoughts on nanny berries? I saw that too. I mentioned the black hob viburnum. And that's a cousin of our native nanny berry viburnum. I would grow nanny berry, I have here in Waverly, as a small tree. It wants to get big. You can keep it smaller, but it wants to be 15 to 20 feet tall, eventually a multi-stem small tree. The problem with it for us here in Eastern Nebraska is it, get, it almost always gets powdery mildew, but it's just a cosmetic thing and it's still a great plant for birds, so. All right. Well, thank you very much, Justin. Let's give him a, a round of applause. Well, thank you, guys. I really enjoyed it. Oh, good. Good. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting. And
Yeah, and thank everyone for participating. It was some great questions. So have a good evening and a good month, and we'll see you in May. Hey, I'm taking book uh, on uh, whether or not the um, um, 